Let, let me let me let me just say at the outset that I have no idea what directions uh, the conversation this evening is uh, is going to take because we have for you not one, but uh, but two uh, very irreverent, uh, observant, witty, and candid personalities who uh, have at times. Uh, ranged widely in their penetrating and passionate critiques of, uh, of events and, and people, uh, and could take us uh, uh, who, knows, who knows where in the next hour. Uh, but I expect at least some of the talk uh, will have to do with the, the future of, of American democracy and how to, to save it from, from villain, villains, uh, va vandals, and ourselves, uh, because that at least is the subtitle of Bob Garfield's very trenchant uh, and engaging new book, American Manifesto. Uh, and he's going to be speaking with uh, fellow journalist Mark Leibovich of the New York Times, who uh, also uh, has a, a keen interest professionally and, and otherwise in, in what's happening in, in our democracy. Uh, now, Bob has had a, a diverse uh, journalistic career uh, that now has spanned um, more than four decades. Uh, he's been a reporter, a columnist for USA Today and, and Advertising Age, a contributor to the Washington Post magazine, and he's written for a, a number of other publications. He's also made his mark in the world of, of casting, both broadcasting and, and podcasting. Uh, he, for a dozen years, he was a commentator correspondent for NPR's All Things Considered, specializing in, in quirky Americana. Uh, he co-hosted a popular podcast for Slate called uh, Lexicon Valley, then ditched that to create Audible's podcast series, The Genius Dialogues. Uh, in which he interviewed MacArthur Genius Grant winners and, as the New York Observer put it, uh, brought his own hearty sense of wit, charm, and candor to the proceedings. Uh, most consistently since 2001, he's co-hosted the weekly award-winning uh, public radio program on the media, which covers journalism, technology, uh, and First Amendment issues. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I'll skip over Bob's involvement with ABC, CBS, the NBC, and, P and PBS. Uh, but uh, I will say that along the way, he's published a collection of short essays, as well as books on advertising, marketing, and, and the media, uh, plus a novel. So all in all, uh, a pretty e eclectic resume. In fact, his online biography begins with the sentence, Bob Garfield isn't exactly a media whore, but he's extremely promiscuous. In his new work, American Manifesto, Bob examines the, the dangerous atomization of our nation into ever smaller interest groups, each with its own desires and grievances, coupled with the disintegration of, of much of our mass media. Uh, but he follows this analysis of our national unraveling with six recommended actionable steps to counter the divisiveness and pull our fractured country back together. Uh, now, as for Mark Leibovich, his official title is Chief National Correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. But what Mark's especially known for are his incisive and often entertaining profiles of political and media figures. Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic once famously called Mark the most important journalist in Washington for his ability to make his profile subjects look like rock stars on the one hand and to make others look like complete idiots. Uh, Mark's been a journalist for 30 years and also has written several books, including the best-selling This Town, a searing examination of Washington's political class, uh, and his most recent, uh, The Big Game, about the most powerful people in, national, in, in the National Football League. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bob Garfield and Mark Leibovich. Hi, Bob. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, should I start? I guess I'll start. I'm the guy interviewing you. Hi, Mark. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a delight to see you all here. Um, I mean, I say that prospectively. I have no idea how this is going to go. Uh, Bob has written a book. Bob has actually written a manifesto. Um, it is called American Manifesto. And um, if anyone's looking for a good manifesto to read, this is, this is your thing. Um, now, I want to actually just start with something because, and it's the kind of thing that people, that usually is a telltale sign that the guy asking the question didn't read the book, but I did read the book. But the, 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 the tot tell telltale sign is you go for a pull quote on the back and you ask about that. But I actually think it's kind of interesting. So I'm going to read it. 
In the vast, bland American wasteland of homogenized, regurgitated media, there is a lone heroic taco truck. Bob Garfield is that taco truck. <laughs> Nourishing, defiant, also very smart and very brave. American Manifesto is his spicy masterpiece. Alec Baldwin. Uh, you think he read this? How'd you, how'd you get him to like, be, how'd, how'd you get him to like blurb your book? If only my mother were alive. Mm -hmm. To hear me being compared uh, to a food truck by, by a movie star. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, this is a great book. I read, I read it. I got it early. I am excited to talk about it. And it is not the kind of book that I usually like. I sort of usually like something that is not a manifesto. I have never writ read a manifesto before. I mean, I guess I might have read the Communist Manifesto in college or something. Um, did you have a favorite manifesto that you modeled this after? <laughs> no. No, I've got to tell you, my media diet was pretty much manifesto-free mm -hmm. um, uh, myself um, until, until I wrote this. Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to do this? Uh, I didn't decide to do this. What I decided to do was a book that uh, spun off a stage show I did a couple of years ago called Ruggedly Jewish, which was an exploration of my Jewish identity such that it is and try to look at it in the context of where we are as a society today. And they laughed, they cried, there were weird stories in it. And I thought it would, it would uh, be a better book than it was a stage show. And, but I, I, I just couldn't pull it, pull it off. It did not work on the page the same way it did on the stage. So um, I got me to thinking, I said to me, Bob, I said, I said, Bob, is there another way to approach this that, um, you know, is a, a, a little less theatrical and, uh, and maybe I could sell to a publisher mm -hmm. and, um, and find an audience, you know, willing to page through it. And after some fits and starts, I came up with this. Uh, it, it worked. I have to say as a, and yeah, we're trying to like get people excited about the book, but it actually, it worked, I thought, fabulously. And uh, what was great about it was as I read, I wasn't sure there was going to be a call to action towards the end, any kind of, uh, any hope basically to cling to. And I guess sort of backing up, um, how, how, this sounds very basic, but how do you write something like this? I mean, you've written a lot of nonfiction, you've written, um, I don't know if you've ever dabbled in fiction or anything, but is there like a strategy to actually sitting down and, and write what is essentially, what, a 150 page essay or something with, with a very sharp opinion in a very, very fast changing time? Uh, it was just me being me, and uh, how does that happen? Uh, huh. You know, it uh, it it has to do with me being having having a lot of thoughts on a lot of subjects, also being a an inveterate smartass and breathing every breath, thinking of the next punchline, and trying to use the skills that I have to to. Or write a serious book without seeming like such a wiseacre that it's not taken mm -hmm. seriously. So, the process of writing the book was a balance of trying to, to, to make some serious observations about mm -hmm. the society and about our politics and about our future, uh, uh, to be entertaining along the way and uh, and to to be sort of erudite without being ponderous. Did Did you find how much of this do you feel what was triggered by Donald Trump and all that he has represented over the last few years in our politics, in our culture, in our media world? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not placing the name. <laughs> fair, fair. How That's, much? Are, how about Mike Pence? <laughs> uh, this book would not have been written but for Donald Trump and this particular political moment. Uh, so a lot. Mm -hmm. But it's not about Donald Trump, and it's not about how to combat Donald Trump. It's about how American society and American politics uh, got to this stage. And, uh, you know, I think I'm going to dispense with the full pivot, <laughs> um, partly because I don't have the set of three teleprompters and partly because of um, disintegrated uh, discs in my back. So <laughs> I apologize. This is the last you'll see of me. <laughs> um, so the question is, how, how did we get to this point in society? Not only were we just so polarized, but where uh, truth itself 
uh, has been turned on its ear and where we are so nano fragmented into countless tribes, uh, often known as filter bubbles, uh, that the, the, the possibility of actually c penetrating them with facts and evidence, empirical data, documentation, history, it's, it's a fool's errand. You, you, you just cannot permeate those filter bubbles on the right with, uh, with reality. And you know what? What were the what converging factors created this situation? And that's what the book presumes to do: to explain what it is about American society going back 243 years, and the uh, the uh, the internet and the digital revolution. How did they converge to create the situation we're in right now? And by analyzing those two general spheres, I came to the conclusion. That, uh, that actually it was, it was inevitable. Because of the American fixation on identity that goes back to the preamble to the Constitution, uh, that, uh, that, and because of the American myths of, of uh, whether it's the Great Gatsby or, uh, or uh, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, who's a Ragged Dick? Ragged Dick, who wrote Ragged Dick about Ragged? Horatio Alger, thank you very much. I'm a senior American, <laughs> and there are some deficits, is all I'm going to say. Okay, so, you know, the, the notion of self-improvement is so ingrained that as children, you know, we are told anyone can be president, which is fine. You know, it's nice to be aspirational. But it turns out that, you know, we're told by our parents and by our commencement speakers and Thomas Jefferson that we are guaranteed the pursuit of happiness. The thing is, we are there upon expected to find it. We are expected to do an assay of who we are as people and then fix that. And if we don't do that, if we don't meet these outsized expectations that every American uh, should hold dear, why, why aren't we a great disappointment to everybody? And one of the premises of American Manifesto is that that great disappointment is materializing right now in, in Trumpism. Uh, and that, you know, if you'd asked to Tocqueville, you know, back around, I don't know, when it was 1840 something, where does this all lead? He would have said, a man with an orange face uh, doing terrible things to the law. How, um, how is the American fixation of identity to, to blame to some degree or any degree to Trumpism, or to, to, for Trumpism? The, the sort of the phenomena of Donald Trump having the support of you know, 40, 50 percent of the country, um, much of it shrouded in a kind of identity, grievance, victimhood, whatever you, you, know, you call it, a lot of those things, and I think a lot of people would agree with you. How much of I guess how much of that was inevitable around the American fixation on identity? I'm glad you asked that question. I shall now talk about evolutionary biology. <laughs> I, I've already said that I believe that there is a peculiar American fixation with identity, and I can give you a little more detail about that in a moment. But it's actually not just a human impulse. Uh, and a biological impulse in all human species, uh, I'm sorry, in all animal species, uh, the, the, you know, why does a peacock show off its feathers? It's so a peacock can impress a peahen. And uh, why do certain other species have characteristics that call attention to it, which enable it perhaps to mate, but also enable, make it a better target for a predator? Uh, it, it runs entirely through the, the uh, animal species and also plants. Plants themselves in their root systems signal to insects and to other plant series species what they are, what's going on there, and it has to do with self-protection and propagation. Plants, it's a nature thing. And uh, this, uh, all, all living things have, are impelled to announce themselves. So, uh, and you know, and it's, Obviously, if it's true in root systems of plants, it's probably true of Europeans and Latin Americans too. Or I'd say, yeah, and uh, and South Asians and East Asians and whatever. 
uh, it's a human it's a human compulsion to try to let the world know who we are but nowhere is it more pronounced than it is here and partly for the reasons that uh, I, I was discussing that that we are told to make something of ourselves which is a very short leap to invent ourselves and um, and just think of from the time you were small how you your how your clothing decisions and how your tastes in music and art and everything else were not just what they were but they were an announcement to the rest of the world what kind of person you are uh, you know it's one thing to be a uh, a Steelers fan it's another thing to announce to the world that your being is essentially that the Steelers are central to your being because you have your, it on your clothes and you have it on your bumpers. Oh, hello again. I, I lied. <laughs> Here I am again. Uh, it's so central to your being that you clothe yourself in it. And we, um, you know, and you know, vanity plates for crying out loud. If you go to Belgium, you will not find a license plate that says, I love tofu. You just won't. <laughs> and so, so. As a, as a society and a culture. Is that really true? I mean, I mean, uh, not literally true, but it's actually vanity I think they plates. just have number plates. They may have vanity okay. numbers. Interesting. You know what okay. I mean? <laughs> Three, yeah. seven, four, eight, yeah. eight, eight, nine. Yeah, I don't know. I don't and know. Those are the Flemish ones. Yeah. yeah little uh, Belgian language uh, humor there. Mm. So, so it's no surprise then that our politics, especially in a country that has such a rich history of oppression, mm -hmm. would also... Uh, find itself carved up into do first tens, then dozens, and now hundreds. Sometimes it seems infinite number of nano fragmented ide identity groups, each with its own grievance. And this is happening mostly not on the right, but on the left. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to go in for a few more seconds, and then sure. I'll, you know, let you uh, pretend to be involved again. <laughs> it, the, the <laughs> I have swivel powers, though. I can face these people. <laughs> this guy came out on a crummy night. His compensation was one cup of coffee, which he doesn't get to drink. And he's enduring this. I think he deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Can I leave now? Mark Leibovich, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, best-selling New York Times author of mm. This Town. Uh, big game, not so Also, much. it was a bestseller. At one week. Yeah. It was? Yeah. Muscle so all about tough. identity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, um, you want to so ask me some I, questions? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is actually, Tom let me, Brady really like? Let me pro Okay, actually, seriously. Yeah. When, how does identity bleed in, or how does identity pollute itself into victimhood, grievance, um, of the kinds of things that, are, that, that you're seeing you know, as rampant? as you see identity politics, identity, you know, sports, what have you? Well, the first reason is, first and foremost, is that because they should be aggrieved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the grievances are about real things. We are in a society that has systematically oppressed all sorts of others, all sorts of mar marginal groups, all sort of, sorts of non-power groups. And I am delighted to say that from World War II on, Overall, uh, there was a, just an enormous amount of success in this country, kind of leading the liberal democracies of the world in addressing these grievances, in righting historical wrongs, and using legislation to, uh, to, to not fully, but at least partially, uh, fix what was broke in, in civil rights, in, uh, you know, the Moran decision dealt with uh, people who were deprived of uh, rights when uh, accused of a crime. They, uh, we largely dealt with the church-state problem from the First Amendment in, uh, uh, with, uh, by, by taking prayer out of the schools. Uh, and and th all of these addressed certain kinds of injustices that had you know, existed for the, the history of our nation. Um, and, and more and more and more, you know, most recently LGBT and you know, trans rights in particular, a, a change in American law that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. So, so good for identity pro politics, good mm -hmm. for the progress we've made as a culture. But 
But two things. Number one, it created a backlash. And all these people, these disappointed, teeming, seething, resentful folks who, who never did achieve the American dream as, as it was explained to them, it was their responsibility to achieve. All of those people who, uh, who are, are seeing what they thought was their country being divvied up among brown people and other outsiders and others who they perceive as taking what was rightfully theirs and along the way slapping them in the face about their own values mm -hmm. and about the nature of the country that they cherished and grew up in, that creates a backlash. And they have, they have found an expression for that rage and that resentment through the very identity politics that they've been watching the left involved in for all of these decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, and this is what the alt-right is. This is what Trumpism is about. This is where nat white nationalism and nativism comes from the, the, from the, under, out the woodwork and all of a sudden seeps up and is now live every night on Fox News Channel. That's how these things happen and I believe, and then, and then technology, Google and Facebook in particular, um, because they are algorithmically set up to do this and because it is their business model, they discover that feeding people who want to be angry the same stuff over and over and over again generates them more page views, generates them more advertising, and, and they get obscenely wealthy by serving kids all dessert and, and no spinach. And uh, it's the convergence of these identity, this identity phenomenon with the digital revolution that I think is so ruinous. So uh, this is gonna sound like a bit of a curveball, but I, it's, I think it's somewhat, on, it's on point here. The, you are a, you're a media critic, you're a media reporter, you're probably best known for being the host of On the Media on NPR, which is a great show. Um, if you could, as a sort of soldier for democracy here, take three American, no, not necessarily American, three businesses, three media properties, just off the table and eliminate them as a way of improving our lives, what would you choose? Oh. <laughs> That's not a curveball, baby. Okay. That's... <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't take them off the table, but I think Facebook and Google are toxic mm -hmm. to uh, the society. And uh, you wouldn't eliminate them, though. I mean, you have the right. No, you have the power now. Oh, I, so I'm no, salting. No, I'm taking. You can right? take. You can eliminate three media companies right now, and you know, if you want. Okay. Um, the one I'll eliminate is uh, is Murdoch and Fox News Channel because they are spreading. Uh, not only a counter political viewpoint, but lies and disinformation and misinformation and propaganda uh, day after day, night after night, for years and years and years. And they have created for us, their audience uh, a, a, a set of worldviews that are, are based on lies. And uh, you, wanna, you wanna talk about your fake news, that's one stop shopping. And it is an obviously corrosive effect on the culture. And, and by the way, you know, there have always been, first of all, our whole history of journalism in this country began for the first century and a half. It was extremely partisan. That was the norm. But, in, you know, halfway through the last century, there were certain, uh, there was certain professionalism uh, that, that began to take over. Uh, and it kind of coincided with highly concentrated media companies uh, beginning to acquire everything. But the fact is, newspapering and uh, journalism in general got less and less partisan. You know, th th there was a time when the whatever Rochester Democrat Part Chronicle, if that's what the paper was called, uh, was really espousing a democratic point of view. But, you know, that, that's long gone. That kind of uh, thing in the newspaper business no longer exists, except in in the uh, right-wing media, which exists explicitly to counter what they perceive to be a left-wing bias in the rest of the news. But it's not just that they bring a right or a conservative perspective to stories and ask questions that the, 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 the biased, liberal, mainstream, lamestream media 
refuse to ask, it's that they uh, propound lies. It's that they spread lies. It's that they give oxygen to liars. It's that they, it's that they carry the water for politicians' big lies. And, uh, and you can see what it has wrought. And when the, by the time the internet came along, there was a ready audience accustomed to getting the news it wanted to hear to validate its worldview. And uh, that is, it's toxic. From my perspective, it is immoral. Mm. And uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's time to stop. Now, I'm not suggesting that the government intervene. Never, ever, 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 ever. What I suggest They don't that, have to. They have Bob Garfield to intervene. I just right? gave you the power. Right. I'm, didn't we agree that I got sure. to choose? Yeah, Absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I do believe the marketplace, the marketplace that they so love to talk about, should intervene. And uh, I think uh, advertisers who are underwriting this kind of poison should be called to account. You know, at, uh, I saw a very well thought out and articulate criticism of that idea by Jack Schaefer, who mm -hmm. is the media critic, I think, for Politico. Politico. Yeah. And he said, you know, we really don't want brands to be the arbiter of what, what uh, uh, is legitimate journalism. Right. And which, you know, that made me think a bit, but it occurred to me that advertisers have always been arbiters of what is appropriate content. They have always formed that, for, played that role. And, and so encouraged media themselves to be gatekeepers of the kind of stuff that they would carry on their pages and on their air. But, but so, Okay. More of that. Don't you think, though, that you're playing into their critique in that they would say, um, you know, we're not being heard. We, I mean, they would say that, you know, I work for the New York Times. They would say that the New York Times should be the first. Many, many Fox viewers, I'm sure, would say that the New York Times should be in the top three media entities that should be eliminated immediately. Um, you know, I hope, you know, I don't agree with that. But wouldn't, I mean, isn't this just a symbiotic sort of cycle of grievance that works in both directions that, you know, again, some people just do better than others? Yeah, that's true. Uh, it works exactly like that. Uh, there is one difference, and that is uh, to, to uh, destroy the argument that the New York Times and the rest of the media have some sort of uh, ideological bias, uh, and, and more on that in a second, uh, you, you know, if you, you have to present evidence. <laughs> There is none. However, if you read a, a fine new book called American Manifesto, you will find in its pages, uh, it's, actually a, it's actually a quiz, it's a challenge. I, I, I challenged conservatives who think that uh, the, there's fake news going on in the, in the mainstream media to present I, one, one example of it. And I said, now let's turn to Fox News Channel and there's page after page after page of absolute outrage. They can say, you know, the, the media news organizations are populated with people who are generally politically progressive. So that's one thing, that's true. And the other thing, second thing is that uh, progressive values very much overlap with journalistic values. Speaking truth to power, uh, 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 afflicting the comfortable and uh, comforting the afflictive, looking for corruption and malfeasance and misfeasance in government. You know, these are all things that are perceived as, uh, as liberal, but they're also core to the, to the watchdog role of journalism uh, as enshrined in the First Amendment. So, uh, yeah, I'll give you that. But the people who talk about, when the president talks about Newspapers just making things up, inventing sources, making up quotes. There are protocols at real news organizations. That cannot happen. And when, in the handful of times in the last 50 years it has happened, uh, it has been a cluster fail for everybody. And you've worked at the Washington Post, you know, the Janet Cook. Uh, you worked at the she New was York before Times. I was there. You yeah, worked at yeah, the New York yeah, Times. Yeah. Look what happened to... Uh, to Judith Miller when she got caught being suckered by the White House into validating uh, phony intelligence data. 
there, there are consequences when you get caught in an error, and when, especially if you get caught making stuff up. Jack Kelly at USA Today, his, he was you know, immediately cashiered the moment it turned out he was inventing anything. It just doesn't happen except on the right, where once again you can find chapter and verse. The Seth Rich murder, the poor young guy who was walking the streets of Capitol Hill and was murdered in an apparent robbery. On Fox News you heard about the conspiracy, uh, that, that it was the Democratic National Committee who... He worked for the DNC he, and they tried yes. to tie him to... Yeah. yeah, he had leaked to yeah. WikiLeaks and then he, I, yeah. Yeah, who knows what the, what the theory was. It was not far off from Pizzagate, which is also completely batso nuts. Sure. Um, no, I mean, there's real world consequences, obviously, to this. I mean, I guess, at, at what point do you sort of throw your hands up and blame the consumer, blame the reader, blame the voter? Uh, not across the board, but if you're looking for a solution here, because the, the last third of this manifesto is something of a, you know, it's a, there's a solution embedded into this. How, you know, when do the people such as they are take back whatever this world has been taken away from us? Well, what is thank, the call to thank action? you for the question. Uh, and there is one, because the, the American, uh, um, What's my book called? American, American Manifesto <laughs> presumes that at least for the next generation, none of this is going to happen in the courts. Mm -hmm. that, that ship has sailed. The judiciary has been stacked. Uh, the Senate does not look like it's going to change immediately. So, uh, you know, legislation, corrective legislation doesn't seem to be an immediate answer unless the the Democrats, and by the way, I am not a Democrat. I am not a Democrat. But uh, the Democrats don't appear to be getting a supermajority in the Senate anytime soon. So uh, don't look to the institutions to, to fix these problems. Uh, we have to look within ourselves. And the manifesto portion of the American Manifesto, the last third of the book, is devoted to six points where I demand that you and in you and you, oh, get back. <laughs> Stop being complacent. Don't do your political activism on Twitter. Primal screams don't do any help. If you are in despair and if you feel rage, there are things that you can do. You know, uh, if you want to mount a boycott, who am I to stop you? Uh, I, I think if, on, on the question of nano-identity and the, the cost to the body politic when there's so much factionalism among people who really should be comrades in arms, uh, if you can influence whatever identity groups that you belong in to think of common cause and not of you know, ever finely sliced grievance, do that. Look, I'm not saying kumbaya, you know, mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 no. What I'm saying is, if you, let me give you an example. May I give an example? Sure. Example. The Women's March. Shortly after Donald Trump was elected, there was a Women's March, marches in all over the country, and you know, I don't know, something like a, William, a million mostly women on the streets all over the country protesting his statements and his conduct and presumed policies against women. And it was a ma magical moment because it's not very often that people take to the streets here. This is in France, this is in Hong Kong. People don't generally leave Netflix to go protest, protest. But they did. It was magnificent. It was inspiring. It gave you hope that the, the, the complacency was on holiday. And then what happened? Well, here's what happened. By the time this, the next year's march came along, there was all these internal rivalries within the w Women's March organization where uh, the black members of the Women's March organization weren't fast enough to renounce the insanely anti-Semitic uh, and vile remarks of Louis Farrakhan uh, to suit the Jewish women in the movement. And, you know, long story short, the Chicago March got canceled. Uh, in L.A., the march got canceled because 
the, according to reports, I have no independent verification of this, but uh, the African American members of the steering committee were afraid that there would be too many white uh, and Jewish women in the march and that their, their oppression would be expropriated by people of privilege. The whole nine yards, like, whoa, we have a chance to go into the streets and protest the insanity that is taking place in Washington. And this is compromised by some internecine feud among the people who are supposed to be outraged about the same thing. No, I'm not saying one side is you know, completely right or one side's completely wrong. What I'm saying is there are bigger fish to fry. There are children in cages. There are wars being started on a lie about embassies being attacked. There, well, we haven't the time to go into the bill of indictment. Why, why, why squander energy fighting amongst yourselves when the enemy is, you know, about four miles from here? Uh, I want to move to questions, but let me actually ask you one quick thing that we can try to tuck in before the questions. Do you feel like that this activism such as it is or what we could see in the streets is in some ways moved online in a way that has given people the illusion of activism well twitter does that thing right that very thing and of course these filter bubbles which are the the groups on facebook or the algorithms that that feed you more and more of the content that that you know that does its job of really pissing you off and making you want more and more and more uh this does all live online and mm -hmm. Facebook and Google through YouTube, instead of trying to mitigate these uh, the phenomena, are they're they're just you know turning up, uh, you're turning it up to eleven, hmm. and obstructing the federal. For, let's talk about the Russia uh, interference in the election. Facebook, when contacted by the investigators representing the Senate who were trying to get to the bottom of exactly what happened alongside of the, the Justice Department. They provided some data, but they provided none of the data from their vast data set that, that, that would have been able to abs absolutely quantify the amount of sharing that took place of, uh, of fake news uh, because they did not want to compromise you know, they, uh, their uh, proprietary data. Now, the fate of democracy in the United States and the rest of the world was hanging in the balance. And they just, they just didn't want to divulge too much. What? 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 And then Mark Zuckerberg, as he has done in every one of these scandals going back 15 years, said, oh, it, we, we did not do well here. We promised to do better. And the next time... It's the same, and it's the same, and the same. He, I'd like to tell you that Donald Trump is the single most powerful and dangerous man in the world, but it's not true. Mark Zuckerberg is the single most powerful and dangerous man in the world. So Fox, Facebook, is that a second? Is that the second I, I think they company? need to be. I okay, think what's Fox, the, what's Google, the third? What's Google and, and Facebook, uh, I believe, need to face very, very serious antitrust review and uh, it, it requires a whole new protocol for antitrust. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but how does that happen? Well, that's if citizens start talking about it. Citizens start to, uh, talking to their elected representatives about it. Citizens start writing to the FTC, not tweeting, expressing your rage and despair to the people who can make decisions. As I said, I don't think institutions are going to have a whole lot of influence on writing this ship. But when spurred by large numbers of citizens doing their duty as citizens, being active in a participatory democracy, amazing things can happen. Just look at same-sex marriage. Who thought they'd see that in their lifetime? It can be done. Okay, um, questions. Uh, we have mics Lots here. Lots of mics. Lots of mics. Well, I see that one. Uh, there's a mic. And we have questions, it looks like. We yes. have a, a line forming. Um, uh, so, yeah, go. So I heard you this morning on 1A, and I've heard you many times um, on, on the media. And it's interesting to see the body that goes with the voice. 
Uh, Striking, isn't it? <laughs> I wonder about your your attribution that this kind of started on the left. I, I mean, I was born in the 1940s, and I remember when the country came together after World War II, and everyone was seen to have contributed something. Um, I think it happened at a very specific time in 1980, or actually in 1968, when Nixon started the Southern strategy. That was what um, launched uh, the problem. Uh, blacks felt humiliated, and do you remember the commercial, maybe you don't, um, for uh, the senator from South Carolina uh, in, uh, against uh, a black mayor from, Charlotte's, from Charlotte, North Jesse Carolina? Helms. Jesse Helms. Yeah. Um, the ad that said, showed a white hand crumpling up a pink slip. You needed that job, but they gave it to a black, um, even though you were better qualified. That's what started it, and what the resentment, what has caused the resentment, and the, is big business that moved their that 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 destroyed unions, moved their plants overseas, and blamed it on blacks, uh, illegal immigrants. Let me ask you a question. Excuse yes. me for interrupting. What started the Middle East crisis? I just don't think right and left are the same. Uh, fair enough. Uh, my point, though, is it's it's really Im impossible to pinpoint a single event in a, a, a set of politics that has had reaction and opposite reaction going back decades. You know, you could argue since this is a country that had slavery right. in, into the mi it's built middle in. of the nineteenth century, that, that there's always been something. My the argument I'm making in my book is that uh, it's when uh, it's when the society started systematically addressing these injustices that the backlash mainly began. Their racism ha is, as uh, it's Chris Rock there. says, that train is never late. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the forces that uh, that are unleashed today in the political right are in direct reaction to the 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 uh, perception of lost power that you can trace to actually the corrections to the ills in our society. Now, you know, one of the possibilities is I'm wrong. That happens all the time. But, uh, and if you do not believe me, I have three children who can testify to a fare thee well. But, um, but I think it's for the purposes of argument to try to understand the dynamics uh, especially on the identity side. Uh, uh, I would say prayer in the schools and the Miranda decision and the Civil Rights Act are a pretty good place to start. Politically correct. Well, yeah, and yeah. it was branded. The, the political right for the last 50 years has been sloganeering about a biased media, about political correctness, and you know, it's not entirely a figment of their imagination, uh, but uh, it's been caricatured and misrepresented, and uh, and here we are. Bob, you mentioned the Miranda rights. Uh, you have a right to remain silent, and let's take another question. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks a lot. Larry Checo uh, chalked me up as a very concerned citizen. Um, did a lot. Of, thank you for the conversation this night. Uh, you did a lot of talking about identity. And one quick story, if you don't mind. But when George Bush uh, won a second term in office, a friend of mine's mother lived in London. The very next day, she called her son. And she said, Jeff, yesterday was uh, Iraq. Yesterday was Bush's war. Today, it's America's war. And I would just like to bring that up to this next election. Because I think a lot of the world, and we just, my wife and I just came from Europe, and people are pissed. Uh, a lot of the world may give us a pass this first time. You know, you bought a pig in a poke. You didn't know what you were getting. Now you know what the pig is. And um, if we elect them a second time, so to your point, you know, Robert, um, one of the first things we can do is vote. And I'd like to make that, you know, a primary objective of everybody in this room and tell all their friends. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you wouldn't call me Robert. <laughs> My mom used to do that when I was in trouble. 
<laughs> also, state troopers, Robert, I am going to issue you a citation. Hey, Bob. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm, uh, I haven't read your book. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'm sorry, you have not read my book? <laughs> Do we have anyone else with a question? <laughs> Please, I'm Thanks. sorry. I'm uh, loosening me up a little. I'm, uh, uh, I think uh, what I'm about to say re relates to a lot of the issues that you brought up today, but you didn't bring up this one in particular, and that's I've been volunteering uh, in maximum prison for about 14 years through a wonderful program called Alternatives to Violence. And um, I find a great sanity in prison uh, with the, the men that do this program to share their hearts and have people from the outside come in to also share their hearts. I go into a, a prison on Friday and come out a temple on Sunday is how I feel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so now I've been working with youth uh, to keep them out of prison um, uh, in um, mentoring capacity and circles in schools and one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling that there's a huge lack of uh, passion for that. Um, uh, and um, I feel like Donald Trump represents the epitome of how far, how many generations we can go without mentorship and men blessing youth and their beauty and their brilliance before we get to this place of him. And you see his diabolical ch children holding these dead animals that they shoot in Africa. I have some good news for you. <clears throat> I think it's true that he has sucked all the oxygen out of the, the nation's room and that he is the focus of, of the, the worldview of some, what Hillary Clinton would call the deplorables. But <clears throat> there is a movement called restorative justice that is based on the premise that, that incarceration uh, not only is not, but that it has never been the solution to dealing with violence. and the endemic problems uh, that, that are attached to, to poverty and education and, uh, and so forth, and has found another path. And it is being embraced, even in Trump land, by more and more uh, political units, counties, and, and so forth, uh, and that it entirely turned the judge, jury, incarceration model on its head. And with, with a great deal of success. And it's built on empathy, it's built on the, the needs of the victim and also the, the circumstances of the perpetrator. Recidivism is way down. So even, you know, I get up in the morning every day in rage and despair. That's, I, 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 I'm enraged before I brush my teeth. But there are, there are pockets of progress uh, if you get out of Washington, you know, I know that's trite, but actually government, which is obviously dysfunctional in Washington, it works pretty well, not in state houses, but in communities around the country. And there are people who can get together and solve common problems together. Even people who are disagree uh, find ways to solve co uh, common problems together. So it's not that every corner of the country is riven by bipolarization, by and large, it's okay. It's only on the national scale and maybe the statehouse scale where it's, it's so horrendous. So uh, okay. look up restorative justice. It's, it's pretty hard. I'm warm. familiar with it. Hey, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Would you, have, would you say as a fellow, I'm, I'm a cynic, I think you're a cynic, um, staying in Washington, has anything about the Trump <coughs> era made you feel hopeful? Because one thing that I've found is that a lot of people who thought they were beyond caring or thought they were above it all actually realized that a lot of this stuff is for keeps and it actually is precarious and um, you know maybe maybe there is re maybe that itself is a sign of hope. Yeah, and you know I was hopeful when the women's march came and then never saw anyone on the streets ever ever since. Um, I was hopeful in the midterm elections, which were the consequence of a lot of people who otherwise had not raised their hands to run for office and otherwise had not raised their hands to, to support a political candidate, had done so. Uh, so, you know, that gave me some hope. But in the meantime, I've also seen democratic tools and mechanisms uh, uh, usurped mm -hmm. towards non-democratic goals. And I've watched the president's political base remain exactly the same 
through these three years of unlawfulness uh, and depravity. So um, on, on that point, I, I'm not hopeful. And, you know, and the third thing I've seen, Mark, is a complete a precipitous drop in trust and faith, not only in government, but more or less all of the society's institutions, okay. yeah. uh, most particularly the press. The public is giving up, and there, there are poll data that I have seen, and not hokey internet polls or cable news polls. I'm talking about significant polls by Pew and Gallup and others, uh, the Democracy Project, that show that a very significant percentage of millennials, and it's over 30, are prepared to give authoritarianism and army rule a try because they're so disaffected by where democracy has gotten us after 243 years. Army rule, dude. And that, that, that is, is, are the stakes. Those are the stakes. And you know, I don't, I'm out of the prediction making business, but he could be reelected. And who, who knows? Who knows? So hopeful? Yeah. All right, next question. <laughs> Bob, I'm Alex Van Oss, old, old NPR. Give my best to Brooke. I will. Uh, you mentioned going within. What do you do when you have a relative or someone close to you who starts speaking in tongues? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not quite as apt to cancel people as my children are. Uh, my, my, uh, my, what are they, Gen X or millennials? I don't know, my 30-some thing, children. Uh, if, 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 if you get caught on the worst day of your life doing or saying something untoward, uh, you're over as far as they're concerned. And I'm not quite like that. But uh, I make a living listening and trying to understand why people think what they think and believe what they believe. And I don't have any sympathy for MAGA mentality. I do not. But I'm obliged to try to understand where it comes from. I'm obliged to be respectful. But, um, you know, I, when I see someone in a MAGA hat on the street, I don't go up and strike up a conversation because I'm not that interested. Uh, in having one just just to feel like I'm hands across the aisle. And and since you're old NPR, let me just say I'm not any kind of NPR. Our show is distributed on NPR stations, but we are produced by WNYC, and we are um, distributed by WNYC to 450-some stations. Uh, it is a show of criticism and commentary. I am not a reporter covering the news for NPR. It is my job to ask hard questions and to make judgments and to uh, kind of call them as I see them. So I don't want you to think that because I uh, am so frank about my uh, loathing for the way this country has, has turned that uh, I am somehow speaking institutionally for NPR of which I am in you know no way connected. So uh, please, if you got an issue with what I think or what I say or what I write in this sparkling new nonfiction <laughs> title, American Manifesto, uh, it, it is an NPR's fault. Hi, Bob. Hi, Mark. Hi, Jim. Gosh. I oh, first met this man when he was 18 years old. Wow. And you were 17. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, your socks, your socks remind me uh, that you are involved in a project called Purple Democracy or Purple Project for Democracy. And in it, even though you've talked about how this is um, the solution does not lie with institutions, in that project you talk about the role of the press as a major institution. And I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, because it, it, as you noted, we're an institution that is not highly regarded, yet Perhaps the burden is on us to uh, to fix this thing called democracy, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, yeah, I would like to see the the press 
and the media in general take up that challenge. The Purple Project for Democracy, which is an ongoing project to, you know, I was referring to those, those data points about how people are giving up. We, we are doing our best to try to reverse the, those trends. Uh, it, is, it is utterly nonpartisan, believe it or not, if you can hold two apparently conflicting ideas in your head at the same time, the Sandinista who's been speaking to you all night is not the guy who's involved in the Purple Project for Democracy. That is all about trying to get people engaged again and to recognize the stakes of, of giving up on democracy and to understand how even our highly flawed uh, uh, democracy compares to other, other forms of government around the world. I mean, I can complain about the United States political mess all I want, but uh, we're, not, uh, we're not Poland, we're not Hungary, we're not Turkey, we're not Myanmar, we're not Philippines, we are not Brazil, we are not Russia. So, you know, I, I, I just think people need to have some perspective about what it is they're giving up when they start talking about authoritarianism. So I just got the whisper, so. Okay, uh, yeah. so, uh, I don't care. Yeah. No, no. So, uh, so the question is, what's the path forward? How do we restore faith? Well, the press is in a weird position because it is seen as a big part of the problem. And I believe that the press uh, is so averse to being pigeonholed as uh, some sort of liberal, uh, uh, f not fourth estate, but fifth column of, of partisanship, that we should say, that's what they think, fine, let them think that. We are going to perform our function of education about basic civics to teach people actually how things do work, if only to disabuse them of the fantasies they have about, uh, about how our, our democracy functions. And uh, to, to show, you know, to focus on heroes of democracy and to remind and to, and to show comparisons to societies that are not blessed with our form of government. So that's what Purple is, and you'll be hearing more about it in 2020, OBS. And, uh, you know, I only hope that wholly apart from this polemic that I've written, that we as a society can remember what, what it, an extraordinary gift it is to live in this country. Let's fix this system, not go running to the devil you don't know. Yeah. 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 And speaking of extraordinary institutions, uh, thank you to Politics and Prose itself, an extraordinary institution, and um, it deserves as much support as we can give it. So thank you, yeah, Brad. Thank you all for being thank here. You. And if I could just say one more thing. Um, you obviously are under no pressure to buy books. I would like for you to buy a book, but if you should decide to buy a book, what I strongly advise is you buy two in case, God forbid, something were to happen to the first one. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again.